correct. Okay, now, almost there. That was pretty darn good. But even your nose cells or your eyes cells, all of them have the same map. The only the thing... Only certain, only, only the certain gene correct. Only certain part of the map is going to be read in certain cells. That's what, what, what I want to know is how... Perfect. The, but what I want to know is how the, how the gene or the cell... Knows what part... That's what we're constantly start studying. What is it that causes cells to read only a certain part of their genome constantly being researched? Um, there is some answer. Certain chemical messages have, have been found in certain cells that initiate transcription and translation of certain parts of that genetic material. As far as all cells, we don't know. We're constantly trying to research and find out. Because if we knew the answer to cells like cancer cells, for example, if we knew the answer to the question, what is the trigger that causes them to reproduce, then we could inhibit it. Now it's yeah, but think about what's going on. It's, yeah, but does but it's a much more complex machine than we know. That's because we keep screwing up this planet, so we're going to need someplace else to go when we blow this place up. So, so anyways, back to cells. So, before cells divide, make new cells. And again, you come from one cell, so when you are developing as an embryo and fetus, we have to make more, yes? Before they can divide, they have to make sure that the new developing cells that are going to be created from that one cell has the map. So the map is your genetic information. So we have to duplicate the map, those chromosomes, that are going to result in copies. So there's two copies of the map. So how many chromosomes do you have? 46. 46. What do you have to do before the cell divides? Do the math. They have to be divided. What do you, how many do you have to? Two. So what's 46 times two? No. What's 46 times two? 92. OK? There's a lot of 92 as opposed to 46, yes? So again, think about what has to happen in that small space when I double the amount of stuff. So say if I said to you, before you're going to move your apartment, I'm going to duplicate every single thing in your apartment before you move. It'd be a whole hell of a lot of stuff, wouldn't it? So what do you have to do to it? Make it small. And that's what's going to happen there, too. When that's happening, after I've duplicated my genetic material inside the cell, and I'm starting to pack it all up tight so I can move it, you can actually start to see it. And that's what you saw under the microscope. It looks like big, fuzzy, hairy, I call them spider legs. Yes? Now you can see them. So we're taking chromatid, which we've made copies of, and we'll call the two copies of the exact same thing, sisters. They're sister chromatid. They contain the exact same genes. So say on any given piece of chromatid, I have gene red and gene green, and we'll just use two colors, red and green. I have to make copies of this, yes? So I'm going to make copies. Well, there's actually two sides to this. Let's pretend it's a whole thing. I'm going to have to make two copies of that information, right? Now, before I split the cell, I'm going to have to pack, make everything small. And wouldn't it be nice if I could keep these together? So what I'm going to do is tie them together with a protein so I don't separate the two copies. I have to be methodical when I move. I have to make sure that when I move, my stuff gets to the right place. Or when the cell splits, 
Each one gets one copy of the copies that I've created. So I tie the two copies together, the sister chromatid, with a protein called the centromere. And when the cell divides, that's going to be pulled apart. One's going to go to one side, one's going to go to the other side. And we can assure that during cell division, both of our do two brand new cells have the right genetic material. So sister chromatid are going to duplicate are duplicates of chromosomes that will eventually be pulled apart and separate from each other. Once they separate, each of the chromatid is a full-fledged chromosome on its own. So if this was chromosome number one, this would be number one, and that would be a copy of number one. And both the cells, when they divided, would have a number one. Yes? And what's going to result is that a cell is going to be identical or have the identical genetic material than or as the original cell. So that's chromosome number one. I'm going to make copies, create sister chromatid. Who's going to hold them together? centromere, that little protein, and when the cells divide, I'm going to pull them apart. One's going to get one copy, one's going to get another copy, and look it. The two daughter cells are going to look exactly the same as what? The original cell. You with me? Focus. So cell cycle is kind of like the life of a cell. Kind of like your life, what happens? You're born. Then you have to do like, you have to grow for a little while, right? You gotta pay taxes, you gotta do all your, you know, gotta get a job, gotta go to school. That's the growing part of your life, right? And then someday you decide, I would like to reproduce. <laughs> to somebody to help me pay taxes. So that's the reproductive part of your life. So when we look at the cell cycle, it's going to consist of you being born, you growing and doing what you're supposed to do for a cell, and then eventually, if you have the ability, dividing and making two new daughter cells. So if you're a skin cell, for example, you would do that. So there's two distinct phases to your life as a cell. The first one is called interphase. That's the I'm growing after I've been born, doing my thing, doing what I'm supposed to do for a living. And then we have the mitotic phase. And what's that phase? Yeah, that's when I'm reproducing. That's when I'm making two. So there's different stages that'll happen during a cell's lifetime. Most of your lifetime as a cell is lived in what stage? Interphase. We have G1, S, and G2. What happens during this? Well, G1's kind of the growing, doing what I need to do for a living stage. And when I decide it's time for me to split, and who's going to tell me when it's time to split? It's another thing we're constantly researching. What is it that causes a cell to go into S, G2, and mitotic stage? It's some sort of chemical message that says, OK, it's time for you to make more. And that's constantly being researched as well. We do know some cells signals. Skin cells, for example, we know their signals. Yeah. But we don't know all of them. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, it's a little more complex than that because when we make copies, just like it, so we're in the, in the group, right? There's a lot of extra pieces on the ends of our genetic material. They're called telomeres. And every time we reproduce a cell, little bits of those telomeres 
kind of get lopped off. Kind of like when we take material and we put it together and we sew it together, we have little bits of threads left on the outsides. I can only do that so many times. I can only snip off some of the extra so many times. And then that cell won't divide anymore. And that's the aging process. If we can figure out how not to snip off the little ends, no, we don't want to flush them because they're important. They're going to allow the cell to replicate. Once they become too short, the cell won't replicate anymore. See where I'm going? So let's talk about the different stages. What's going on during these different stages? Again, most of your life is spent in interphase as a cell. Depends on the cell, though. If I have skin cells, say I got a cut, a scrape, what's happening to the cells that are trying to fill in the blanks that you've created with a cut or a scrape? They're multiplying, but are they doing it slowly? They're doing it much faster. So it depends on what's going on in the body or where we're talking about. Most of the life is spent in interphase, but that time, depending on what the cell is, could be very different. Do you see what I'm, what I'm saying? So during interphase, a cell is going to do its thing. Be a cell. Do what it's supposed to do for a living. Before it can go into the next stage of life, it has to make sure it has all of its parts. And this happens at the beginning of its life. This is kind of confusing. I don't like the fact that they put it there. But when I am first born, I have to make sure that I have all the cell parts that I need as well. So part of the whole division process, and we'll talk about it when we talk about mitosis, is actually replicating all of the organelles or replicating the cytoplasm. That process is called cytokinesis. And that's part of, I don't know if I spelled that right. K-I-N. So that is actually the replication of the organelles or replication of the cytoplasm. And then we have to grow in size. The mitotic stages of my life is when I'm going to replicate, take that replicated genetic material that I replicated during interphase and make sure it gets split properly to the two brand new cells. So my, the mitotic stages include all of those things. It's going to take me to package up my genetic material that I replicated in interphase and send it off to two brand new cells. So mitosis is where the nucleus and its contents divide evenly into two daughter nuclei. And then the cytokinesis part is division of the cytoplasm. I hate that because people don't understand what that means. What does the division of the cytoplasm mean? Yeah, but what's in the cytoplasm? You're thinking cytosol. That's the liquid part. Yeah, the organelles, exactly. So I have to copy all of the organelles too. And that's what the division of the cytoplasm means. I also have to make copies of mitochondria. I have to make copies of endoplasmic reticulum. I have to make copies of, what else? <laughs> Golgi apparatus, right? Yeah, ribosomes. ribosomes. That's the replication of the cytoplasm. And that's cytokinesis. Yes? Correct. Say it out loud so everyone can hear. Go ahead. Yep. Correct. You can't move to a new apartment unless you have, you know, a room. You're going to need a bathroom. You need a kitchen. Yes. You need all to bring all your stuff. That's your baggage, right? But you need you need things to function in that apartment, right? 
Okay. So, during mitosis, one of the things that's going to help me split those sisters apart is some of the cytoskeletal elements we talked about when we talked about cells. Remember when we talked about cells and all of its parts? We talked about the cytoskeleton. Mitotic spindles are basically parts of the cytoskeleton, little microtubules that are going to help to split these guys apart evenly and give them to our brand new daughter cells. Spindles are going to grow out of little organelles and they are called centrosomes. Very close to that other word, the protein that holds here. What was that? Centromere. So don't get the two confused. Centromere was the guy that held the two sister chromatid together. Centrosomes is basically another little organelle we're going to find inside the cell that produces these little microtubules or mitotic spindles. Now, during mitosis, we're going to have four different phases that take place. Basically, like, just like you moving into another apartment, you find out you have another apartment, what are you going to start to do? Pack. So prophase is the phase in which I'm going to start to wrap up all that genetic material. Remember, I doubled the amount of genetic material in what phase? Interphase, during the S phase of interphase. That's, yeah. I don't know why they call the S. I don't know. Synthesize, yeah. So prophase is where I'm going to pack everything up. The other thing, when I go to split those sisters apart, it would be a pain in the keister if that nuclear membrane was in the way. So the other thing that's going to happen during prophase is I'm going to get rid of that nuclear membrane, that wrapping that I had around the nucleus. That will allow me to split things apart. Then we have metaphase. Metaphase is going to line all of these guys up in the middle. Anaphase is going to take those microtubules with the help of those microtubules and pull the two sisters apart pull them to opposite ends of the cell. And then at the end of anaphase and through telophase, which is basically going to create those two brand new cells, this takes place. And what was that again? Cytokinesis. What is that? Not doubling. It's separating the or, excuse me, doubling the organelles. That's what you said. So in your book, on page 126 and 127, we're going to visually see all the different stages in a cell's life. Interphase, if I look at any given group of cells, most of them tend to be an interphase. When you looked at your cells under the microscope, your plant cells, most of those cells were in interphase. I can tell interphase because all that genetic material is loosely unpacked and lying around the house, just like you living in your apartment. All your stuff's unpacked and lying around the house. It's not thick. I can't see it. It looks like sand almost. That's the nucleus I'm pointing to. When I start that process, I duplicate the genetic material here, and then I start to do what? You see it? I'm starting to package it up. You can actually start to see it. By the end of prophase, what do I have to get rid of so I can make this split nice? That nuclear membrane. It's just in my way. I'm going to get rid of it. And then these two little what's what the heck are those? Yeah, those are the centrosomes. They actually are going to replicate themselves here and then do what? They're going to move to opposite sides of the cell. Now remember, what did they make for me? 
the spindles, the microtubules. Do you see them shooting out of here? So they're coming up green with this stain. Of course, we don't have these fancy stains in our lab, so we can't see all the beautiful colors. But in this, you can actually see them. So the microtubules that are coming out of there are green. The chromosomes are stained what? Blue. So by the end of prophase, we've packaged them all tight. Metaphase, what are we going to do? We're going to take the sisters and we're going to line them all up in the center. The microtubules, I kind of think of those guys as fishing poles. Anybody ever go fishing? Okay, so this would be the place where the microtubules were born. What's that called? Centrosomes, yes? That's my fishing rod, yes? And what comes out of the fishing rod? The line, yes? Microtubules. So here's my fishing rods, centrosomes. My line, microtubules, they're coming out. And everybody's lined up in the middle during metaphase. So one microtubule will catch this end. One microtubule will catch that end. And what happens during anaphase? What happens when you catch a fish? You're reeling in. So what happens to the microtubules? They're being reeled in. They're shortening. And as they shorten, they do what? Pull them apart. So during anaphase, we start to see those microtubules shortening up getting reeled into the centromeres and, sh and pulling the sisters apart. So during anaphase, who's going to get broken? Yes? Good. What else is happening at the end of anaphase and during telophase? At this point, I'm going to start replicating the organelles, cytokinesis. So it starts here and finishes up here. During telophase, now what am I going to do? I'm going to pull them to the opposite side, hopefully get my duplicated organelles. But then I have to create two brand new separations. So what you're going to see is the cells start to pucker here. What's forming here? plasma membrane, right? If it's a plant, I also have to make more what? Now you can say it, cell wall. Remember, plants have both. So a plant has a cell wall on the outside and then a plasma membrane on the inside, okay? That's called the cleavage furrow. In this, this is an animal cell and we can start to see it here. What else has to happen? during telophase. Well, I gotta, I gotta, I've moved into my apartment. I got all my boxes there. Now what I have to do? I've gotta unpack all that stuff and put it where it belongs. So I'm gonna start to unpack my genetic material and put it where it belongs. What am I gonna reform? Nuclear membrane. Okay? You with me? With me? Good. So cytokinesis usually begins at the end of anaphase and continues through telophase. This is where we're going to divide, make copies of the organelles in the cytoplasm. And it's different in plants and animals. Again, because of that extra step that plants have to do. They have to make more cell wall. In animal cells, cytokinesis. It's known as cleavage. Begins with the appearance of that little cleavage furrow. It's an indent at the equator, or the center of that cell. In animal cells, cytokinesis begins with the formation of a cleavage furrow. Oh, it's not working. At the site of the furrow, a ring of microfilaments contracts, much like the pulling of drawstrings. The cell is pinched in two, creating two identical daughter cells. 
So there it is. See that little blip? That's the cleavage furrow. So that's going to fold in daughter cells. Okay? So when the plant cytokinesis begins when vesicles containing cell wall material collect at the middle of the cell. This, along with that cleavage furrow, is the formation of the cell wall as well, and it's called a cell plate. You with me? So when I stain these cells, and the, the only way I can see these cells is to add color. Because most all cells are what? Clear. So when you look at your cells under the microscope in lab, they're stained. You did it, right? Did you use stain to look at your cheek cells? Yes. Okay, if you didn't use that, it would be very hard to see under the microscope. So the nice thing about this is the stain is picking up different colors. You can see the cell wall and you can see the plate beginning to form here in the center. The nuclei, and this whole thing used to be one cell, yes? Until two daughters were formed. What do you think is going to happen after these guys are formed? It might, or they might do what before they start the process over again? Because they're only half the size as their mother was they're going to go into interphase and do their growing. So this is what you probably looked at under the microscope. So see how many you can pick out. Now all of these guys here with the big dots, those guys are in interphase. What do you think the big dot is? It was something that ha hung out inside the nucleus. Do you remember? Nucleolus. Remember that? OK, so that's what these guys are. So who's this? Everybody's lined up in the middle. That's metaphase. Who's this? Anaphase. Who's this? That's telophase, the beginning of telophase. Everybody's starting to group up again, and eventually we'll see the plate form in the middle. Who's this? That's prophase. So this is earlier prophase. That's later prophase. You see how everything is becoming much more packed and central than we see here? We still have that nuclear membrane in this one versus this one who's starting to get rid of it. What's this one? That's anaphase. What's this one? That's metaphase. OK? Why do we have so many different, I'm just looking at one view of cells here. What is this? Why do we see so many different stages in this one view? Or it could be a, a group of cells that are doing what? Growing. When you looked at that little root tip in any plant, we're, go we're going to see cells rapidly dividing. So we can see in one little piece of tissue many cells in many different phases of mitotic division because this is a rapidly group excuse me, rapidly reproducing group of cells. Where else could we see all of these different stages? In any group of cells that were reproducing at a rapid rate. So each cell has a cell cycle control. Specialized proteins that send messages, start and stop. Certain key points during the cell cycle, these messages are sent out. Cells follow what we call cell rules. 
I'm only going to start dividing when I get the signal. And these are the normal cell rules. I'm not going to keep dividing unless there's a need for me to divide. So in this given space, in any given tissue, there's only going to be a certain amount of cells. Once I've reached the max capacity, I'm not going to divide anymore until somebody dies. Okay? And then I'm going to divide to fill in the space. Again, that's normal cell rules. Cancer cells, on the other hand, don't follow the rules. Right? They don't care if there's not enough space for them. They're just going to keep dividing. They don't wait for their signal. They'll divide when they want to divide. And that's what makes them abnormal. So cancer is a disease of the cell cycle. Cancer cells do not respond normally to the cell cycle controls. They don't follow the rules. What causes them to, to be produced? A whole bunch of different things. Because certain amounts of your genetic material are responsible for making sure you follow the rules. And sometimes when cells mutate, they mutate not in a good way and cause the cell to become out of control with respect to the cell cycle. Cancer cells can form large groups of themselves. And what do we call those? Tumors. And that is a group, a whole group of abnormally growing cells that create masses of body cells. Now, if the abnormal cells remain in a tight little group at a single site, it can be called something called a benign tumor. But what happens when they start to take up way too much space and decide to move to a different neighborhood and start setting up a house there? Yeah, so when they start to spread cancer cells beyond that original site, of where they originally or origin or of where they originated is called a metastasis. Malignant tubers can spread to other parts of the body and then interrupt normal body function. Basically what cancer cells do is take up all the food. They take up the space and they take up the food. Away from who? normal cells, exactly. So that can disrupt different body functions. And depending on what the body function is, it can also disrupt the function of the organism as a whole. So a person with a malignant tumor is said to have cancer. These cells that keep growing and have the ability to go set up house somewhere else. It's an example of breast cancer. And one of the reasons why breast cancer is such a pain is because breast tissue is very glandular. Lots and lots of cells and lots and lots of pathways back into the body that can spread to other parts of the body. This is called your lymphatic system. So when a tumor sets up house, and is allowed to grow and invade this breast tissue, it can very, very easily do what? Yeah, take a ride in the lymph nodes and spread to other parts of the body. So that's the big problem with certain cancers developing in certain places. Some cancer therapies involve chemical therapy or radiation therapy. And what's the goal of both? Kill those abnormal cells. Stop them from growing. Stop them from spreading. So radiation therapy is going to damage genetic material, disrupt cell division. Chemotherapy is going to do the same thing, but using chemicals. Unfortunately, until recent years, chemotherapy basically attacked what? It, attack, yeah, it attacks rapidly reproducing cells. Now. What rapidly reproduces in our bodies? Skin. skin cells, exactly. And hair is a derivative of skin. Nails are derivatives of skin. Those cells reproduce at a very fast rate. 
So unfortunately, conventional chemotherapies also attack those cells too. That's why we see some of the side effects of chemotherapies as what? Hair loss, nails, skin issues. Certain behaviors can decrease the risk of cancer. Certain behaviors can increase the risk of cancer. Because we know for sure certain things about cancer. We know for sure that certain chemicals increase the rate of forming cancer cells. So, is that a choice? You choose to smoke, yes? Just saying. Why would adequate exercise help us decrease the rate of ca forming cancer cells? When somebody adequately exercises, what's one of the things that they increase in their bodies? Hmm? Yeah. Increase circulation. Increase moving healthy things through our body. Increase moving things through blood vessels and lymphatic vessels like cells that are constantly maintaining our bodies. Not to scare the living bejesus out of you, but you're making cancer cells all the time. Why do we not all have cancer right now? Your body can control it. How? Uh, Those cells I was talking about. You have a system of cells that are constantly surveilling your cells. It's called your lymphatic system. And inside your lymphatic system, you have cells that help with your immune system. Those cells are constantly on surveillance. They can tell when a cell has gone abnormal based on the proteins on the surface of that cell. Once you develop those cells, abnormal cells, what does your immune system do? Kills them. So why do people get cancer? If that happens, it might not work correctly, it might not work fast enough. Cells can get under the surveillance wire, right? And have time to reproduce themselves at a fast rate. So if I can make sure that my immune system is up to par as much as possible, and the other things that are going to help is to avoid things that we know cause mutation rates to increase. Avoiding exposure to the sun. What's the matter with exposure to the sun? Get too high an exposure to the sun. Sun's UV rays can actually damage your genetic material. We produce pigments that help to protect our genetic material. And we increase that production when we expose our skin to the sun. Some of you might have done that this summer. Or some of you might go pay to sit in a, like a, a box to do that. What am I talking about? Tanning. Tanning. Why do you get darker when your skin is exposed to the sun? Yeah, you produce more of that protective pigment around your cells. It's a brownish pigment called melanin. So when you expose yourself to the sun, you produce more melanin to protect your genetic material from the sun. So we have varied shades of skin in the human population, don't we? Some are very dark and produce, their cells produce a lot of melanin on a regular basis. And some of us at the opposite spectrum, very light. We don't produce as much melanin. Are white people more prone to cancer? Yes. Than dark yes. Because they have less what? less melanin production, less protection. But do, do dark people tan? Yes. <laughs> yeah. They just have better protection than we do. So lighter people have less protection. So we have to be more careful as, as well. So exposure to the sun. Eating a high fiber, low fat diet. What's that doing for me? Keep everything moving. Because remember, all that stuff in our digestive systems, if it hangs out for too, too long and doesn't move along the way it should, it is trash, you know. 
Imagine if you weren't able to put the trash out, ever. What happens to it? It kind of festers. Why does it smell? It ferments. Exactly. That's what it does in your intestines, too, when you let it sit for too long. And you can develop or increase your chances of developing what kind of cancer? Colon cancer. Self-exams. Something's different. I have this mole I've had for years, and all of a sudden, it's twice its size. What should you do? Go to the doctor. Go to the doctor. Get rid of it. Yes. It's, it's such a complex answer. Um, there are certain genetic components which seem to predispose or increase the risk of certain cancers. Um, the BRCA gene, for example, in females. If you carry that BRCA1, I think it is, um, you tend to have a higher incidence of forming breast cancer at earlier ages. So is there a genetic component? Probably. But remember, genetics isn't the only thing. What else? Environment, lifestyle, exposure of those genes to be expressed. We carry ma a lot of code, and some of it is never expressed. We never open it up and make proteins from it. And that's one of the genes that we see. So if something is different, if something changes, go to the doctors. Get it fixed. Yes? Melanoma, skin cancers. People think, oh, little mole, not a problem. Big problem. Yeah. Because it can do what? It can spread very quickly because of where it is. It's very highly vascular big lymphatic system area. So if we start to see changes, we start to see something's different, we start to sense something's wrong, go get it checked. Meiosis. A little bit different than mitosis. Actually, same kind of thing, except what we're going to do is split the cell twice and skip the interphase part in the middle. That's basically the difference between mitosis and meiosis. So when we're talking about organisms that reproduce sexually, we talk about the process of meiosis. And basically, at the end of meiosis, we're going to have a cell that doesn't exactly resemble the original parent cell. What's different about it? Half the genetic material as the parent cell. Now, you came from one cell, yes? You came from two cells that came together to form your one cell. Those two cells had half the genetic information you needed to make you. So for every bit of code that you have, every bit of information that you have in your genetic material, you have two copies. One came from who? One came from mom and one came from dad. Exactly. So reproductive cells, meiosis, is important because we're going to make cells with half the genetic material in them, only one copy of information. For example, eye color. How many copies of information do I have for it? Two. One from my mother, one from my father. So meiosis is making those reproductive cells so that two of them can come together and give that brand new individual two copies of all the information they need to make a brand new person. If both parents have blue eyes and they're both sexually transmitted, why do we all have different eye colors? You only have two copies of the information, but is there all, uh, let's, let's, create an, uh, let's create an analogy. Books in a library, they're all books, right? But they're not all the same books, right? So the code, you have two copies of eye color, but your genetic information might be different. 
So the information you got from mother versus the information you got from father might be different. And the way they interact and express themselves in your cells might result in different proteins. How about ones that come out with one blue eye and one brown eye? Where did the different colors come from? If, they, if we all started from one, two humans, Adam and Eve, let's say, then why do we all have different eye colors? Why do we all have different hair colors? Why do we all have different skin colors? How did that happen? Mutation. <laughs> Those are mutations, changes, differences in code, and how the code reacts to each of the copies that you have. What else influences how you pr express your proteins? Environment. Okay? So all of, all of those are factors in how you express your genetic material. Is that making more sense now? Yeah, but it was, it's just kind of weird that when you look at my family yep. and everybody is like... Well, I'll tell, you a story, I'll tell you a story in a minute, but I want to just get through this, okay? Different individuals of a single species have the same number and the same types of chromosomes. So, chromosome number one has A, B, C, and D. And that is bits of information for, let's call this eye color and skin color and hair color. See where I'm going with this? So we all have the same number of chromosomes, and those chromosomes are going to code for the same things within a species. Human somatic cells, the ones with 46 chromosomes, have two copies of information for every single bit of information that we possess. So I have two copies for eye color, I have two copies for skin color, I have two copies for hair color. These cells, the ones with 46 chromosomes, are called somatic cells. Soma means what? Body. Body. So those cells, no matter where I take them from, if I have a nucleus, doesn't matter what the cell is. It's got 46 chromosomes. It's got two copies of information for everything. So if I pull one off the end of my nose and I do a genetic map, I'm going to have the whole thing. If I pull one from blood cells, except red blood cells, they don't have a nucleus, I got the whole map. If I pull one from my liver, I have the whole map. You getting the point? Those are somatic cells. If I Take a cell that is undergoing mitosis, actually in that S phase of interphase where it made copies of everything, and I pull that out and I lay it all out. That's called a karyotype. And in the karyotype, and you can see one on the bottom of page 130 in your textbook, that's an actual map of a cell that's ready to split. And we see 46 chromosomes. Well, we see 46 doubled chromosomes. 23 what? Pairs. When they pair up, they're going to pair up with the chromosomes or genetic material that has the same traits on them. So when they pair up, they're going to pair up like this. So this might be this might be dad's and where this one might be yes but they're always going to hang together those are called homologous chromosomes so they tend to match up because they possess the same genetic information. Can possess different versions of that information. So 
I might have this. Oops, nope. Yes? Different versions of the same gene. So this is a karyotype. We see 22, and then we have this little weird pair over here. So how many chromosomes do I have? 46. I have 23 pairs of chromosomes. You with me? The first 22 pairs of chromosomes are called autosomes. A-U-T-O, like the car, somes. The 23rd pair is weird. That 23rd pair possesses information within the code that's going to make me either a male or a female. What do we call the 23rd pair? It's X and Y, yep. We call them sex chromosomes. So the 22 pairs, autosomes. The 23rd pair, sex chromosomes. Because on the sex chromosomes, we're going to find the information that gives us our what? Sex male or female. There's two of them. There's X and there's Y. If you're a female, you have two X chromosomes. So what is this? That's a male. See, this Y chromosome is missing a whole bunch of genetic information, like genetic information that allows you to put clothes in the hamper or put down the toilet seat. gone. It's not there. So you can't blame them because they just, they don't have, it's missing. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So that explains it. See, so next time, next time someone yells at you for not putting your clothes in the hamper, say, it's a genetic deficiency. Yeah, it's not going to work. Yeah. So humans have two different sex chromosomes, X and Y. And then 22 pairs with all the other stuff on there called autosomes. Don't be confused because the sex chromosomes also have other stuff besides just sex. For example, colorblind. Do you know where it is? It's on the X chromosome. But if you don't have another pair, another protein-making part, Color blindness tends to be more frequent in who? Males. Males. So, I'll, I'll explain it. Well, well, if you're, it's it's a sex-linked trait, so we can't call it recessive and dominant. It is recessive, but you color blindness. Or two, two codes. Right. <laughs> one can always display. Like no matter if you get one, like if your mom has carries the trait, you're gonna get it. If you get the X chromosome. You mom. might, because she can give you. She's got two shots at giving you an X chromosome. You see what I mean? If you're a male and you inherit that recessive trait, you're only gonna get one. You can't get another one on your other chromosome to offset it. Make sense? So things like color blindness, you ready for this? Baldness. It's not your father's fault. Whose fault is it? Your it's your mom's fault. It's on the X chromosome. But since you only have one copy, if you in inherit that excess recessive trait, your chances are have gone up exponentially of being bald. Yes? Hopefully. Well, not, true. not true, though, because remember, she's got two. <laughs> Follicularly challenged. So the life cycle, gametes, life cycle and sexual, of sexual organisms is where I would like to pick up on Wednesday. So here's the scoop. 
We're going to finish this chapter on Wednesday. What else are we going to do? Quizzes. I'm going to open up the quizzes on Wednesday. We're going to start chapter who on Wednesday? Chapter 9. Okay? No, 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 no. I'll open it up Wednesday and I'll make it do the following Monday. Nothing. So you have plenty of time to do what? Study chapter 8 and start reading chapter 9, okay? Because we're going to now take the information we get from chapter 8 and we're going to talk about how all this stuff works. And we're going to talk about a fellow named Mendel who did all of this wonderful research. Correct. Correct.